Hi, I'm Mark Groves. I'm a human connection specialist and founder of Create the Love. At an early point in my life, I became obsessed with understanding relationships, the intricacies of how people connect. And through this exploration, I have created a life and a business dedicated to learning out loud and exploring how we interact with each other and the world. This podcast brings the world's top thought leaders, spiritual luminaries, physicians, scientists, researchers, best-selling authors, and health and wellness experts under one roof to discuss the good, the bad, the messy, and of course, the beautiful parts of the human experience. Welcome to the Mark Groves Podcast. I can't wait to dive in with you. It's such an honor. I mean, I, I want to say the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Aubrey Marcus, welcome. Yeah, happy to be here, brother. You know, I owe you my first, exp- I was trying to think, like, when was my first exposure to you? And it was a friend that sent me a podcast episode with Paul Selig, mm-hmm. which I then listened to that and I heard him channeling your, I guess, spirit or soul to yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it made me start to consume his work, which then made me stop drinking alcohol. So I owe, like, that whole space of just sacred synchronicities wow. to that episode so man, wow. I have a lot of gratitude well my pleasure I mean that's what it's that's what it's for I think a big part of my journey is to just open the shutters open the windows to my own personal experience and allow that to be probably the greatest thing that I contribute is oh, yeah I can put some ideas together here and yeah. there but if I can just show what's going on in me I think that's what people find a lot of relevance with more than anything it's just that here I am here's all the stuff here's all the pieces here's the places that hurt here's the places that are really happy here's the here's what I'm feeling thinking and uh, so when I'm with someone like Paul Selig or um, whoever it might be I always try to make myself available as an example because I think that's really helps people relate yeah I think because your my experience of your work your podcast your evolution is that you tell your story sort of out loud you know yeah. you welcome people into the subtitles into the shadow light right. spaces like there you don't hold anything back in terms of your processing like i find your your processing very very humble in a lot of ways well cuz i get humbled all the time i mean i'm just <laughs> the telling the like one i was like wow <laughs> i'm just telling the truth you know right. and i and i guess that is the that is the essence of humility. Humility is just the willingness to tell the truth. Yeah. And I think people confuse it for, you know, falsely downplaying your strengths can also be seen as human. Oh, he's so humble. He's falsely downplaying who he is. That's not humble. That's manipulation. It's contrived, yeah. It's, it's manipulation to try and get somebody to like you based upon a set of rules in which you're afraid that if you show your greatness, that they may not like you for it. Like it's right. all the tall poppy syndrome as they call it in Australia. Um, yeah, humility is just telling the fucking truth. Right. And it's actually a much simpler thing than people than people realize uh, once you just start to trust that you're gonna be okay. And actually that people appreciate that. You know, like people appreciate the truth. That could be as simple as, you know, one thing that I'm really trying to lean into mm-hmm. is let's say you don't wanna go somewhere. Yeah. Right, you don't want to go to this party. It's it's one of your homies, but or you don't want to go over to his dinner party. Most of the time, we come up with some excuse. Ah, oh, I'd love to, but I got this thing, and we put all the blame on this thing. Or even sometimes we'll throw our spouse under the bus. We're like, ah, <laughs> she needs she she, home. she just yeah. you know, and we just do this thing over and over, and we think it's being kind. But what if we just lived in a world where you're like, oh, thanks for the invite. I don't want to and that just be and just like that's okay like that's just normal you know and it's like not a big deal i think obviously because nobody does it it would be like a little bit jarring but (laughs) i really want to like create the world where we can just honor what we want what the fuck do you want it's okay if you don't want to do this cool just tell me i'm not going to take it personally you know that sounds too simple you know (laughs) that's like codependency lingering in all these fears of saying no for sure and i think what you said you know telling the truth telling the truth at the cost of sharing your vulnerabilities at the at the cost of not being liked or being criticized right or whatever that might be and uh, you know i think in my experience in the last couple of years that's especially been important because we've never faced more cancel culture mm-hmm. more 
uh, outrage on the internet. I mean, the internet yeah. is the home of outrage. Yeah. And your relational journey has kind of been a similar, you know, I guess how you do one thing is how you do everything. It's like your relational journey I want to dig deep, more deeply into because I think not only will everybody be able to relate to it, but especially men, you know, in our search for, because you've navigated through the space of dating to polyamory to now being married and ding. And I, yeah, where do we even start with that? So I'm curious in your relational journey, when you were younger, was there always a questioning of monogamy or was there an event that actually caused you to no longer believe in marriage? Because I, you know, I heard in your podcast mm -hmm. episode with your, with your wife that there really was at, at the point when you were ex exploring polyamory, not a belief in, you know, a marriage. Mm -hmm. and so I'm curious, yeah, was that always there? Or was there like a betrayal or a breach of trust or something? Yeah, so I think when I was younger, I was never quite with the person that I wanted to be with. <clears throat> and this was up through college. And um, and I never had relationships that were all that awfully long. So the idea of questioning monogamy didn't really come into play. And also... Mm. I couldn't bear, I couldn't bear the stress of dishonesty. You know, I, I mean, I could try to laud myself as having some noble virtue of honesty. You know, and I think I do, but also I, I just can't bear it. I can't bear the stress and anxiety of dishonesty in that situation. So cheating was off the table for me. But I never was really in a relationship that was quite long enough for that to become. For you to even too think much about of an it. issue, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I think you know if you look, if you read like Dr. Wednesday Martin's book Untrue, you'll start to see in the aggregate around that eighteen month, two year mark, that's where you start to kind of feel the decline in the in the desire to go out and seek novelty. Everything was still novel to me back when I was younger, and then I got engaged to my partner Caitlin, and you know, and I had a couple different serial monogamy situations where I'd get with somebody and split up and. But the real relationship was my first relationship with Caitlin and uh, proposed to her, like, you know, believed that we would get married. We had, you know, we had an arrangement where we could bring in other female lovers into the bedroom. But at that point, I was far too jealous. And also underneath a paradigm that said, we are like, you know, bulls or lions and we will fight to the death to protect our, you know, pride and our, our, our woman and our pride of other, other lionesses or whatever. And that's just, that's just how we are. Right. Mm -hmm. So we operated in that paradigm, but it gave me, it gave me the freedom to not feel constricted by the traditional idea of monogamy. And I guess as Tammy Nelson would say, we were monogamish. Um, but I, I ultimately like, it wasn't quite the right relationship at quite the right time and despite that i had that freedom um which was amazing honestly yeah I mean, it was it was great um it feels like so many the idea of that feels like so much of a dream to so many people yeah. and so i'm i'm really curious how that ends up transcending well it was and it, and it was <laughs> i mean yeah. i'm not gonna lie like yeah it was fucking crazy it was right. it was i mean it was amazing and Ultimately, like I can see the foolishness of my own jealousy in that paradigm because we're not like lions or or bulls. We may have some of those latent ideas that are culturally inculcated, but we're more like bonobos or more like something right. else, right? And that's ultimately, you know, so the relationship with Caitlin ended for reasons not related to sexuality or a drive for novelty or any anything else. It just related to I was looking for a different type of person with more masculine traits the ability to show up on time help me because i was in, i was in like empire building yeah. stage mm -hmm. you know and at that point um you know caitlin was still deeply in her deeply in her wild chaotic feminine and which was beautiful but not suitable for like being the warrior queen empire builder right and so i found that in whitney and so we got to the 18 month mark no outside you know no monogamish straight monogamy and that's where i felt the first constriction of like 
this isn't working. And I didn't have the technology to know how to go deeper into the sexuality to find novelty at depth, yeah. which I think is, is really the crucial technology to not have to just suffer the decline of passion, the decline of your ability to access what Mark Gaffney would call eros, you know, that radical yeah. intensity of presence and interiority with the person that makes that first date or that first experience so like rich and alive. I think there's technologies that you can apply that can actually drop you into novelty at depth, um, which I didn't have then at that time. So I also recently read Chris Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn, yeah. and he completely burst my bubble about <laughs> what humans were and how it should be and I some evolutionary that. biology yeah. prerogative that I should be able to sleep with other people, but my partner doesn't want to and doesn't need to. So I was like, okay, I got to fucking... I got to change my whole paradigm here. And I went to Whitney and I was like, listen, this monogamy thing isn't working. I really think that, you know, polyamory would work better. And, um, she was like, fuck off. <laughs> and we split up, we split up for a couple months, but we still loved each other, Yeah, you know? And like, we still loved each other so much that ultimately she was like, all right, like I'm in, let's try this out. Yeah. And in yeah. the meantime, I'd picked up, a, I'd had a girl that I was seeing. And so she, we were like right into the, right into the fire for her at least. Yeah. And for the first year, you know, I would see this other, this other, you know, this other person and <clears throat> it was really hard for Whitney. And yeah, of course, of course. It would be hard. Yeah. <laughs> and I did not have the type of compassion or sympathy that. For her, should, for her experience. Yeah. No, I was like, you agreed to this. Were you at the same time having to navigate her in relationship with anyone else? Not yet. And that's yeah. when everything, that's when everything changed. So she finally gets with her own partner. And then I recognized what I'd gotten myself into. Because <laughs> it was just, it was as, as much as my brain could wrap itself around mm. the philosophy, every cell of my body was screaming to fight vomit cry run away like all of these different things just this tempest within me that i could yeah. never actually never really ultimately quelled and we gave it a run for a good six and a half years and there were some beautiful beautiful experiences a lot of growth a lot of challenge a lot of you know it was it was every it was all of the different things and i think kind of finally towards the end I'd made peace with my ability to withstand the hard times, um, to enjoy the good times. And I wasn't necessarily happy, but I wasn't suffer I wasn't suffering. And there was at least access to intensely blissful states. And uh and I was actually pretty okay with that, you know. Meanwhile, I'd I'd had deeply, deeply strong feelings for Vilana, yeah, you know, for the last two years of that relationship, but Vilana wasn't op interested in polyamory and didn't want to give it a go and was with another partner. And so I never really got to explore that, but I always had a, I always had this question mark, like maybe, 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 with maybe with her, I'd be willing to try something else, especially because I'd suffered, I'd experienced the full gamut of polyamory, honestly, you know, yeah. with my honest effort. And it it got the best of me to be honest you know it was it was too difficult for me to actually manage in a, in a in a true way where i wasn't being like really burned where you weren't like self abandoning or yeah I'm, exactly i'm curious was your sort of learned tolerance for it or or whatever that might be was there an aspect of sort of disassociation in order to exist in the relationship in the way it was constructed you know like I think like you, I can, I can use my intellect and a book and things like that to construct, okay, I can navigate these things. Maybe I'm just needing to stretch myself spiritually, mm -hmm. consciously, and yet somatically, I'm still coming back to this like inner rage or inner, because I yeah. think of the basis of human relating and you think of in workplaces, it's the same. It's like we need psychological safety and we need to know that in partnership, no matter the construct, there there's this question that's always being asked unconsciously, which is, when things are hard, will you be there for mm -hmm. me? And I tried polyamorous experiences 
in my late 20s, early 30s. And I was like, I can't manage one relationship. I don't know how I'm going to manage like more than one that I was already not designed to even go there. Mm -hmm. And I also found myself having way too many conversations about the emotional experience. And it just felt like my avoidance side was like, oh, all these feelings, I don't want to have to deal with mm -hmm. all this. But yeah, I'm curious, you know, I said a lot there, but curious what you're what you think of that. Well, my coping, so what you're talking about is like the coping strategies yeah. that I use to, to really deal with it. Um, it was more like the just exposure and response therapy, <laughs> you know, which is <laughs> yeah. what you like, how you handle arachnophobia. Yeah. Right. That's That was really it. It was more like, I mean... I would feel the feelings. I I got into trouble spiritually bypassing and and telling Whitney like, no, it's fine. Like go go for a week and see you know go go for a week to Europe with him. I'll be okay. And then like four Man. days in, like I wasn't okay. Yeah. And that was really that was I that was a big mistake. Like mm -hmm. believing and I genuinely believed that I would be yeah. okay when I wasn't okay. Uh, so that was a big mistake that I made, but it wasn't necessarily the coping strategy. The coping strategy was very much like if you're afraid of spiders, then just get a, get a tarantula in a cage <laughs> and look at it and, and like freak out, but keep looking, keep looking until eventually it can walk on your body until eventually, you know, like you're okay with it. You may not like them still, but like you're not going to yeah. freak out and have a panic attack. And that was, that was really, it was really it. It was like exposure and response therapy to arachnophobia wow i mean like and so at the same time at the t the last two years of that relationship you're in contact with your wife so yeah we were we were friends yeah yeah we were friends me and vi were friends yeah can you speak to the closing of your relationship with whitney and then how uh, even the idea of, yeah, it's such a beautiful yeah, so story. I was, you know, I was engaged to Whitney for a while. We called it off. We, um, there were some things that just fundamentally didn't, didn't align many things that did. And I still have a ton of love for Whitney. You know, yeah. I saw, I saw today that she was, she made a post where she was singing on stage in Nashville with her guitar. And, you know, I wanted nothing more than for her to sing on a stage and share her voice with the world. And, I'm so happy for her and uh, you know we don't talk all that much anymore but there's still an immense amount of love there and yeah. I really appreciate her um, but so with Vi I, there was just a feeling there was just a feeling that there was something something different there something right and unique but I could never get her to l actually look at me in a way like we were friends but it was always like she was always kind of like scanning her eyes across me and i would mm. just be be with her like we'd have coffee or lunch and i'd be like please <laughs> please just stop slow down the process and like see me just please see me and it just wouldn't happen until finally i wrote her you know and, it, and you said you listened to that podcast oh, but i wrote her yeah i wrote her some uh a letter which was from my perspective and her perspective and it's just the the narrative that style that I use, but I wrote her this letter and it was, it was the best that I could possibly do to convey the feelings that I had for her. And I can second that. I yeah. heard, we'll put the link to it. In yeah. The thank podcast. you. I appreciate that. Cause I was uh, listening to it. I'm like, if I wrote this to Kai right now, this is, <laughs> this is some good words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember I, I read it to my, you know, my dear friend Kyle and, uh, he's one of my best friends on the planet and we were in Sedona together and I, you know, I had tears in my eyes and, and, uh, I just told him, I was like, this is the best I can do. And he goes, yeah, brother, this is the best yeah. you can do. When you read it too, you could hear the emotionality <clears throat> yeah. of which it was written in. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was and a full her. pouring of my heart. And, uh, and that was September, 2019 and, um, didn't land. I mean, in the revisionist history of Vilana's inner world, it landed in some place, but at least the landing of it didn't get expressed. Um, debatable whether it landed or not, or whether <laughs> the mind remembers what it wants it to It planted remember. the seed, It you planted know, the seed. Unconsciously. Yeah, we'll, we'll, say, we'll, we'll say that. We'll but. take the audio from your podcast, sure. if you're okay with that, and just insert it yeah. in this space. I think that'd be just for context. For sure, yeah. for sure. So 
when that didn't, you know, that didn't really land. And she was in a, she was in a, her partnership was a very painful polyamorous situation that's, that was also so, and I was also upfront with her partner about my feelings for her from the start. So I felt an integrity with all of that. I, mm-hmm. I told, you know, and I, Whitney was aware of my feelings toward Vailon. I didn't read her the letters, of course. Um, but nonetheless, like felt like, look, this is this is my chance to shoot my shot. The container is open. You know, Whitney and I had officially split, even though we we're still seeing each other. You know, my intentions were out there in the open, and here it is. And when I didn't get anything back, I kind of withdrew for a little bit, and yeah. from that friendship, and then kind of made peace with like, all right, like this is this is reality. You know. This person is never gonna. This person is never gonna pay it's attention not to me. It's not yeah. happening. And um, and I'm actually pretty happy. And I remember there was another. There's some other key pieces of that. So January 2020. Again, September 2020. I write the letter. Nothing happens. January 2020. I go into the darkness, and I was really surprised at how much I had to heal from the polyamory journey you know, all the faces and actions of Whitney and all of her past lovers were just haunting me like the ghosts of a soldiers that they've, you know, that they've killed or something. Yeah. You hear those stories, like you see the faces in the night and it was like in the darkness, it was like a waking night terror of all of my own things that were coming up and I got to heal all of it. And also the waking night terrors of my own actions and how subtly I had never really loved Whitney exactly for who she was I loved her for who I wanted her to be like some part of me loved the her that was on stage singing and had the courage to share her voice and was like interested in the spiritual path to the same degree that whatever the whatever the idea was Mm -hmm. which contains within it a subtle form of judgment which then the response of that judgment is shame and actually it was preventing her from actually reaching the thing that I desired kind of like counterintuitively right like because so my the judgment idea of who you love the idea of who she was and she then could by become, doing that I love the yeah. idea of who she could become rather than just loving who she was who she was yeah right now I get that and so there's like a constant like the love not is, quite is good attached enough. to a chase yeah. like you're yeah. not quite if you get there yeah. babe Whew, this, then, this book is good you should try this you know yeah, like whatever totally, it is totally yeah. And uh, and so I finished that darkness and I was like, I got to go back and just love her exactly as she is. And that's like, it's it's essential because I've never done that. And that was my intention coming out of the darkness. Um, I don't know how well I did it. You know, I don't know how well I executed it, but that was my that was my intention. And in doing so, you know, I felt like that completed a final piece of what I needed to do in a way like it was like like to close the door to close the door like without me ever having done that i think i would have felt like i really i really did her a disservice and i still did her probably many disservices and vice versa of course we were entangled in a very challenging relationship doing her best but um that was important and it really liberated me um was it explicit like did you explicitly express to her what you had witnessed yeah. and especially what's so beautiful about that is the acknowledgement of whatever power that creates by the illusion of who they're going to be mm-hmm. like the exploitation of that power totally unconsciously yeah but then even just presenting that i feel like there's sort of an exhale yeah that occurs relationally and yeah. then you're both free you know yeah you i mean I, I told her it was a very it was a very poignant moment in a vision where you know finally even though i was going through all the traumatic memories of our relationship in the vision I, she came to me and she was wearing like all of these feathers and was in her full like spiritual flower I couldn't quotes like you could say mm-hmm. um, which was my idea of what a spiritual flower could be rather than the flower that is always there and is always spiritual mm-hmm. but she comes to me and then she starts looking at down at her arms and her clothes and she looks at me and she says am I doing it right am oh, I doing wow. it right and it was devastating because yeah, I was I like yeah baby you're doing it right yes i'm like i'm so sorry 
you know, because I realized that subconsciously she was always having to ask, am I doing it right? Because I was always judging her for not doing it right. Wow. And so I tried to convey that in the best way that I could, but I think it was somehow necessary to, to kind of close that, to close that chapter. Um, and I actually remember after the darkness, even though I wasn't fully contented in that relationship, I was pretty happy. Like I was, I was on a dating app and things, I was meeting a lot of cool people and I was like, me and Whitney were still having fun and I was still like, life was pretty good. I was pretty, pretty happy overall. Meanwhile, Vailana is like, She's so meanwhile, Vailana was, you know, her relationship had gotten increasingly, increasingly turbulent because of the forced nature of this polyamorous triangle thing that she was in. And um, I love in the podcast how you guys talk about how you invite her into your polyamory and she's like, no, not not that one. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go over to this 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 other one. one. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go to this one. All in divine order. Yeah, right. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And uh, (laughs) so I'd given up, but. I was always like a, I was always a loyal friend and always like, I always, even though I had, I desired her, I, I am, you know, I'm a person of honor and I always treat the, I always treat a woman and treat a goddess as a goddess and a friend as a friend. I just, it's just my nature. Um, so whenever she needed help, I was there. And if she needed support to go on some healing journey or what she needed to do, or if she needed a place to stay, or if she wanted to take her family to a, my ranch or whatever i was it's always a yes you know it's like that with all my friends Mm -hmm. um so vi was kind of repeatedly either getting kicked out or deciding to leave the house where she was living with her partner and so she would come over to my house and uh and so she comes over to my house and that night i had a i had a girl from out of town that was staying at my house and vi comes over and i give her a quick hug i'm like hey you know, like so and so's coming over. I'm like, I'm sorry. You, I ho- do you have headphones? Like, I don't know. It's okay. It <laughs> might like, be loud. Bad timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bad timing. I was like, but your upstairs is yours. Like, enjoy. <laughs> I know. And I saw her for like five minutes. Of course, I have a a great night with the girl that was visiting me. And uh, <clears throat> and then the next day, I come home early from work, and you know, we decide to do a ketamine journey. And uh, and that was it's been a very important medicine for me. And in that journey, um, within the first 10 minutes, and I had no, again, I was like, I was going from one date to another date to another date. Vi was just at my house. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you want to jump in this thing with me? It's four o'clock. Is it just you and her? Just me and her. Yeah. And, uh, and then I had another date at like seven that night, you know, ketamine pregaming. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) For sure. So it was, uh, we jump in and within the first 10 minutes, it was like, we were already married. Like we had been married, we were already married, our souls were married, and there was it was incontrovertible. Wow. And that was that was the moment where it started. And of course there's a lot of things in the three D that we had to figure out. Um, but things moved really quickly. And it moved quickly. Nobody understood it. It was like, Why are you moving so fast? Like what and lots of lots of criticism, especially from you know, our other people we were seeing about like, why, why, why the hurry? You know, what's, what's going on? But people didn't understand like what I had felt and seen, it was already done. Mm -hmm. It was already done. And it was just now time for the 3d to catch up. And so that was, you know, um, just about two full years, two full years ago from now. And, uh, it's been an amazing and powerful journey over these years. And, you know, the thing, I think the key thing for us is to understand how to, first of all, resolve any of the issues that we have, find like that deep place of resonance, but also, as I was mentioning, the ability to find the novelty at the depth. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is the essence of Tantra, you know, on meaning to expand like the, the, the ability to expand a moment because if you expand ev- anything enough you'll find novelty like yeah, you take a magnifying neat. glass to a butterfly's wing and it's no longer just a butterfly's wing which is beautiful but all of a sudden you see the fractal patterns of all yeah. the molecules and you're like whoa it's crazy and that's what you can do with the moment in your sexual expression and your experience 
And so that's been like a deep part of our practice. And I think one of the things that I would really say makes, <clears throat> you know, monogamy work. And we also have our own, you know, we also have our own version of it, you know, that has its own. And I don't want to get into the personal yeah. aspects of that, but we have our own version of it that allows some different freedoms and some opportunities and, and different things. Definitely not polyamory. You know, we both had our dance of that. Um, but nonetheless, it's about like finding the way to really establish the deepest level of trust and to be like, you are my queen, I am your king forever. Like yeah. that is never going to change. I choose you. Yeah, I choose you and I choose you every single day. And, and then from that level of safety, you know, then there's both freedom and the ability and the willingness to explore deep, deep levels of novelty. Yeah, there's something interesting about the choice which creates the the standing still together that allows both because usually one sort of like afraid and running or the other ones you know and it, there's not often just because our wounds make us do that they make us mm. either pull us away or make us chase and then we're not in a sort of regulated nervous system state but just in a space where we're actually able to be curious and go deeper the techno first i'm curious what was the number one thing you learned that you think for people listening might be really applicable from your polyamorous experience and that informed your your choice of your wife and even just because it sounds like it was just once you had the ketamine experience and even the previous um, mm -hmm. uh, feelings for her that as soon as you made the choice it was like it was mm -hmm. done and then all of a sudden you're like we're getting married mm -hmm. and and so yeah I'm curious what you learn from that and then any wisdom you can impart from the what did I learn from the polyamory days I think I learned I learned that <laughs> like the idea of getting jealous now is fucking absurd <laughs> to me like to be jealous of yeah. Vilana at this point you know doing anything is like you don't know what I had to deal with after everything, you know, you've like been after through. everything I've been through, like fucking go for it, go <laughs> tackle this, you know, tackle our homie and roll around with them and giggle. Like, I don't give a fuck. Like, you don't know what I've had to endure. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, so it recalibrates this idea of jealousy and to the mm. point where it's like, unless she's intentionally doing, which she never would intentionally doing something out of malice or, to play get backs or some game that she was playing, which of course hurts more because of the intent and the game. Like that's, that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful place to be in. And that's something yeah. that polyamory can teach you. I mean, obviously like if I went back into full polyamory, I'm sure I would still struggle with the, the challenges that come with that. But since we're not in that, in that, at that level, it's like fucking go for it. Like, right. Live your life, baby. <laughs> like whatever. So that's a beautiful thing that you learn from polyamory is especially when you scale back. It's like, you don't know what I've seen. You know, it's right. like, it's like a Navy seal getting really scared of a, of a bar fight. Yeah. You know, you're like, do you know where I've been? Do you know what I've done? Do you know what like every day of my life is, you know, it's like 10 tours and, Afghanistan and you're at the local saloon and somebody's getting <laughs> swinging frisky. a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> let me finish my beer first, you know, like it, it just doesn't affect you in that well, way. Well, the level of conversations, that's what I find so impressive about the people that I know who are adventuring in there is the level of communication you have to have. Yeah. And that's why I always argue that like, there's probably as many successful monogamous relationships as there are polyamorous. Cause people always say, oh, well, monogamy is much more. I'm like, no, because people aren't great at communicating in monogamous relationships yeah. either. Yeah. And polyamory forces you to have to. Absolutely. Even though that's a, nece a necessity in a monogamous relationship, it's like, it's a superpower in the other space. It, it's the, it it's, the it's the table stakes, right? It's the table stakes and, and radical honesty is also the table stakes. And so that's another thing that it teaches you is the safest thing you can provide is your honesty. And this circles back a little bit to what we're saying, like safety is found in radical honesty. So anytime you're shielding the truth, there's a slap as the real truth comes. And that was a mistake that Whitney and I had to learn over and over again, which was like 
you know, we would be out and I wouldn't know that she had feelings or a thing for somebody. And I'd see like, I'd see the energy and be like, what is up? What's up here? Why is he acting all weird? I remember one time with her, one of her longstanding boyfriends, they went out to dinner the night before with a big group. I I didn't go that night and they'd started to get a bunch of chemistry that night. And I didn't hear about it that night. She came home kind of late. I was sleeping and I didn't hear about it. We all went out the next day and I could you feel could this feel it, and I could yeah. feel him being weird. <laughs> and then I started looking at him like, you won't even look me in the eye, huh? Like, You're like something's okay, up. what's what's going on here? And I was like, and I was like, hey, look at this. You won't even look me in the eye. And he was, he was like being all shifty. And when he was like, oh no, I, I should have told you like, you know, we had like a little thing and he's probably feeling a little bit weird about it. And I was like, Oh, uh, well, fucking A. You right. know, and it's like that flush in my heart. Well, now I got to go talk to him and I got to tell him it's okay. And like, we got to resolve this it. thing. But there was lots of those instances where like a micro mistruth and blossoms and then you get slapped and then you have to deal with it. And it leaves you in this state of like, you're never quite safe. So in the relationship with Bailana, like a big tenet of what our relationship is built on is radical honesty. So if she feels a ping of anything, you know, she tells me if I feel a ping of anything or an attraction or anything like we're just committed to being radically honest with each other. And that's actually what's creating the safety, even though it may create a temporary turbulence as our as our as we regulate to that honesty. Um, it's what builds the foundation of safety and polyamory taught that like a ruthless Shaolin master with a big stick and a long <laughs> beard just fucking whipping me in the legs <laughs> yeah yeah every time I failed so that was another big lesson another big lesson was that I don't want to do polyamory yeah. I don't want to do it it doesn't it's too hard I it's too hard for me um and I think that I'm a quite a capable person and it's still got the best of me so those were like three if I had to you know, there's many other things I learned, but if I had to, you know, condense the three things that I learned, it was, you have no reason to be jealous, except at the extreme, (laughs) you know, you have absolute, it's absolutely important to be radically honest, own your feelings, own, uh, own everything, accountable. And then, you know, that, that third one being that I don't want to live this way. I think so many people place the need to stay together or be together uh, as a higher priority than telling the truth. Right. And because they do that, their relationships are not these containers of safety. They're actually prisons, mm-hmm. prisons where they have to pretend to be someone else. Yeah. And then when truth makes its way to the relationship, which it always does. Yep. Cause you tell truths through subtle things like not texting back or like flirting with someone else or leaking sexual energy to someone else or whatever it might be. And inevitably it comes forth. And, you know, Kai and I, went, we broke up for nine months and when we came back together, that it was, it was very similar, like the radical commitment to like truth first yep. before staying together. Right. Because if, the tr- if avoiding the truth is what holds you together, you're not really together. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm curious in your, now your, your marriage, or you talk about these technologies of deepening intimacy and I, you mentioned something in your podcast with your wife that I, I think is such a rare known piece of knowledge and I appreciated you sharing it was that women get bored of monogamy faster mm-hmm. and men are like, wait, what? No, that's us. Like we're, mm-hmm. there's sort of this underlying narrative that men, we just need to stray cause that's just part of our biology, you know? And, um, yeah, I'm curious in your, in your container of, uh, commitment now, what is the, how do we create novelty through technology? Because I'm sure everyone, like relationship from whatever time to now is like, oh, I need to do whatever that is to, mm-hmm. to live the honeymoon phase, you know, in, some, in whatever way that means. And the honeymoon phase is the expiring period of novelty. Yeah. That's what that is. You're encountering a hyper object that is a human. And a hyper object is far too complex to actually understand. Yeah. Like, and that's what we are. We are, as Rumi said, we are not a drop in the ocean, we're the ocean in a drop. Human beings are infinitely complex creatures, but in our interaction with them, we reduce a human to a story and to a projection that we have of them. And also people can get stuck in their own static expression, so they're not actually even accessing their own depth. So you're stuck in this automatonic loop 
of being this version of yourself that isn't actually radically present or there. So the technology, as I call it, isn't about like a new phone app or something like that. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, that easy, yeah. right? There's an app for this. <laughs> it's a, it's their technologies of presence. So psychedelic medicines are one technology of presence done in partnership. Um, there's the ability to enter a shared space, a novelty rich space where you're able to see each other in like radically new and fresh ways, you know, and that's, so that's one technology. The other is, you know, there's communication technologies, like one of which is uh, a process called circling that was taught to us by a guy named Guy Sangstock, who I have a podcast coming out with shortly. Um, amazing interpersonal communication of like deep listening withdrawal of projection like owning all and like really paying attention to each other mm -hmm. which is slowing down and entering enough deep listening that you're actually getting into the depths of understanding of another person so communication technologies like that and then sexual technologies and the sexual technologies are based on a lot of wisdom from you know the ancient sutras and you know, different practices like breath work, eye gazing, circulation of energy, um, you know, ways in which you can be in loving adoration and words of affirmation, really like devotion, almost like treating your partner like it's a, it's a puja, an offering, you know, to, to the goddess or the, the God, the divine being that is, that is embodied, uh, to other like, practices that involve like power exchange or traditionally like BDSM type of energy exchange, which is actually, you know, counterintuitively people think, oh, it's just getting freaky. It's actually one of the strongest <laughs> spiritual technologies that's available because in the radical submission, you know, you actually learn what it's like to really surrender yeah. to the ultimate divine force. Like you actually model surrender to the divine and and like you get to model that of like letting go complete letting go of control which is an incredibly powerful experience and triggers you know internal psychedelic states transient hypofrontality is what happens in in the submissive state and as a dom in the dominant state you're given absolute power over another human being which is temporarily of course and there's limitations but you're given yeah. this this absolute power which quenches the constant drive for power to such a degree that it actually ameliorates your drive for power in all things you're like whoa i have absolute power over this thing and then and that calls forth when that's satiated it actually calls forth many of your other divine attributes of deep compassion and caring and like those moments after the experience are some of the most tender and loving moments that you'll ever feel. You know, a lot of a lot of what the practice is about is for the moments that come afterwards. And you're high. You're like literally high. So for the for the Dom, they're in a classic flow state, which is a combination of five endogenous compounds at the very least. <laughs> you know, so you're entering into really altered states of consciousness that are always full of novelty and full of like the tension of the experience and i'm not saying it's for everybody and it also doesn't have to be about everybody kind of focuses on the the tools and the instruments like right. sure you can use a flogger or a whip or a handcuff or a rope or whatever but it's really about the attitude it's about the it's about the establishing of polarity the polarity of dominance and the polarity of surrender and the substrate of radical trust that is required that, that. that is required yeah. and is actually reckless <clears throat> it's reckless to engage in that just like it's reckless to go to an ayahuasca shaman that isn't in impeccability it's reckless to go there with somebody who doesn't you don't have that level of trust with i don't care about your safe words like i think it's i think you're playing with technology that's too deep unless you have real trust with somebody who's it's there. interesting there has to almost be like there has to be a deep commitment to the sacred nature of the technology. Correct. Yeah, and when you talk about the dom and submission, you know, clearly there's something 
that you're speaking to that is deeply wanted and yearned for in culture because 50 shades of gray was like yep. the number one selling book and let's be honest it's not a literary award no, it's terrible it's basically yeah and i was <laughs> i laughed that there was like a meme that says uh if it was a dude in a trailer like no one would be attracted to it but there's something about the power that is being spoken to right. and the submission and the technology that clearly there's a draw to and it's the taboo of sexuality and the exploration of sexuality i mean culture religion all these they're all often synonymous do not celebrate the curiosity of our sexuality so much of our sexual exploration has to live in secret or uh, be numbed by alcohol or mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. and to think that one of the radical m ways to get to know another which of course makes so much sense is to connect on another plane through mm -hmm. the i mean se the sacred nature of sexuality indeed indeed and and to be able to play in all the spectrums to not get stuck in only one you know to be able to find just as much depth and novelty in in an eye gazing practice as you can in a power exchange you know sexual practice like how do you how do you get yourself to a place where you're you're absolutely maximally flexible can feel what the what the time and the and the place that you're in is is calling for and you know that's the i think that's the name of the game but i think we need these tools online in order to make you know monogamy really viable without the suffering you know because our mm. craving for that our craving for the the radical presence the eros of the moment that interiority to in the saying yes the full opening to each second that we're in we crave that no matter what so all right it's not in your it's you can't get that in your marriage because you don't have these technologies well you're gonna find it somewhere else and sometimes yeah. that's gonna be with a you know a transgressive lover somebody who you're seeing on the other side um which is all too common of course sometimes it's going to be i don't know you'll find it in some way you'll be hunting or it'll be fishing or it'll be you're going to find some way and you'll make it work you know but uh it, that craving can't be quelled you know the craving no. the craving must have an outlet and if you do turn that inward i think you get very sick and i think that's yeah, part of the dis-ease that we're experiencing is the frustration of the flow, the life force energy that is meant to flow through us. And because we've exiled it to sexuality, then exiled our sexuality to a certain type of uneducated, unpracticed sexuality, and also, you know, shame ridden and whatever other fucking yeah. baggage we have in it. We've exiled our ability to access this radical presence to such a small little section that it's it's one of the the biggest challenges with our world today well it seems like people can't even be present to it because of the shame that's associated sure. with sexuality you know because let's be honest our capacity for shame and i think especially as men is pretty minimal and you know and then a lot of our ways that we numb the inability to be present is to go to devices or sure. to materialism yep you know and it's like how <laughs> It feel I feel like on some level, people have to experience whatever rock bottom might be, which is the invitation into that presence. You know, that's definitely one way to learn. You know? yeah, it's not a good one, but yeah, it, it seems seem, to be how humans do it. It seems to be how we do it. But it's either inspiration or desperation. Rock bottom is desperation. You can just be inspired. Right. You could be inspired by listening to this dive into you know a far deeper understanding of what we're capable of you know there's a great book called the radiant sutras that talks about some of these subtle energy a little bit hard to decode um you know I, I don't have a lot of great books on you know power exchange or anything like that it's it's been um i'm a kind of an experiential learner myself anyways it's how i've really gotten into a lot of my spirituality and a lot of my understanding but there's i'm sure plenty of great books and resources out there to really learn yeah. how to go through all of these different spectrums of experience certainly like and as i mentioned it's not only that there's you know inter you know interpersonal communication technologies there's all kinds of ways that you can develop practices that help make keep the keep the partnership really refreshed and alive you know um i don't ever see 
I don't ever see the honeymoon phase, you know, waning or ending for Vailana and I because we just continue to, we continue to see each other at even greater depth. You know, like date night is my favorite holiday of the year, <laughs> you know, like legitimately. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I believe that that's going to be, it's going to be that way forever. Be, but not because we're special, but because we just have the, we have the techniques. When you spoke to the complexity of the human and that when you turn to your partner with the curiosity of knowing that you can never fully know all the depths mm -hmm. and that makes it a mystery, you mm -hmm. know, it makes it a, an adventure rather than like, a, I already know what you're going to say. Like, you know, like I right. can finish your sentences. I'm right. tired of your shit or whatever, right. which seems to be the normal way that people relate. Yeah, it is. And you start to become less and less tolerant of that you know yeah. like <laughs> like ultimately um i steer conversation into one of two areas as quickly as possible either absolute fuckery and just like going back and forth talking shit you know like having fun having laughs yeah. i love that kind of because there's there's novelty in la in the laughter of course that's the nature of laughter itself if you've heard the same joke 10 times you're not gonna laugh yeah true. right like like laughter is this the thing that's unexpected so yeah it's a sacred gateway to you there's no doubt exactly yeah. so like that's one way i like to go the other way i like to go is to is to depth to try and explore some kind of novel novel thing together to build to build some new machine of of logic and understanding with somebody and those two things get me like really into this into the space and if a conversation is steering in in another direction and i can't change it to one of those i'm fucking out yeah it makes like sense. i'm out like i don't i mean it's not i'm not really interested in that <laughs> you know it's a. Uh, so that's just kind of the that's just the way it is, and it, it's like that a little bit in the relationship. Obviously, there's a more a little bit more grace. Sometimes you have to talk about the banal, you know, normal shit of existence. But I always love to go and take that deeper, ask that next question, that's like a little bit deeper, or expose a deeper layer. That makes it a lot more interesting to me. Well, it makes you need to be present because you've never experienced that moment, that answer, right. that thing. Um, okay, I have two more questions. One, my friend Don is like your super fan, and if he wasn't <laughs> married and you weren't, he might pursue you. He's, uh, but you completely changed his life, as you know, I'm sure many, many, many people. And he, he's like, you have to ask him, what was the number one thing he learned in the darkness? Like mm -hmm. the number one thing he learned. And I listened to your episode about that experience, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a part of me that's like, I got to do that now because mm -hmm. uh, I was afraid of it. Yeah, which makes me think, oh well, there's something that dwells there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm curious, what was the number one thing? If you're afraid of the darkness. You're afraid of yourself. Right. Nothing else in there, and that's why it's important, right? right. Like, you aren't afraid of the dark. There's you're not you're safe. Right. You're like as safe as you could possibly be. So what you're afraid of is yourself and to be afraid of yourself that means you're living you're living in the presence of a constant monster right and like so because yeah. you speak to that in that episode mm -hmm. about discovering those right. parts number one thing that i learned was that <clears throat> as much as i desired to be living like a warrior poet just like full on you know, today is a good day to die. Like I've, I'm living in such a full way that like take me at any moment because I've lived a full life in every breath. You know, this kind of hoka hey mentality. That's my aspiration. A big part of me was afraid of letting myself fully love life because I was always preparing for the next bad thing to happen. Mm -hmm. I was always preparing for some trauma, some stress, something. And I had trained myself not to allow myself to enjoy things too much because I was always ready to handle that next situation. And somehow, instead of really living with my heart open and full of, full of bliss, I was dimming all of that down to prepare myself for some hypothetical loss, heartbreak, 
and that's no way that I want to live. And I wish I could say that after the darkness, I've completely healed that. Um, it's in my awareness, and I'm better than I ever have been. But I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges is the willingness to have the courage to live full out, love completely, enjoy completely, celebrate this existence that we have with as much gratitude as possible, knowing that it can all be taken away like this. Yeah, it's like living in every moment must be lived with grief, but that grief is actually the experience of the fullness. Yeah, yeah well said. Yeah, uh, that's beautiful. And I can totally relate to that. I think given the circumstances of the world, what you're asking of us is to do something that requires being in this world where that is always true, mm-hmm. that that will happen, where we will be hurt, we might end in any moment, and yet choosing to fully keep going past those edges that we know are familiar, that we can tolerate, you know? Um, Okay, my final question is, and I think we're like right on time. Yeah, perfect. Uh, for, For people listening, what are sort of the foundational, beyond the technologies that create more novelty, Mm -hmm. what are the foundational pieces for your relationship with your wife? And the agreements maybe that you have that make it this space because it, it in your conviction it doesn't sound like there's ever any question which is beautiful um, not that there's a question of how life will go but that your choice mm-hmm. and so I'm curious what are the agreements that you have that that create this <clears throat> the interesting thing is is that I think we all we all like to say and even you said it a little bit there, and I don't, I don't want to imply what you meant by that, which is like that, well, you know, we don't know where our lives are going to go, and if our lives go a different direction, we'll just listen to the accord with life itself, and we'll, we'll make a change. And, and while, yes, that's true, there's a level of commitment that goes beyond that. Mm. And I think Jordan Peterson, I never understood this from Jordan Peterson. I never fucking got it. And it was like one of the points that I disagreed with him most vehemently was commitment is a game that only works when you do it. Mm-hmm. Like when you really commit. Like when, it's, it's, when it's done. When, it, when you really commit. It doesn't work if you, have, if you have an out. That's true, yeah. Right, it just doesn't fucking work. It's not commitment because then you're always like n- navigating. It's like... The Spartans didn't say, you know, usually don't give up and try not to surrender. You know, that was not the Spartan (laughs) ethos. It was never give up, never surrender. And that's what made them the most powerful and legendary military force of our time. It was the inflexibility that gave them the, the real power in that situation. And I think there's an inflexibility in my commitment and and in both of our commitment where no it's done it's done like we are committed we are together for life and and that (laughs) it's kind of a crazy thing ostensibly because like we've seen a million we've had a million other examples i've been engaged twice and whatever but i know that to be true and even if for whatever reason it wasn't, it didn't turn out to be true and some other thing happened, I don't entertain that thought. Like, I acknowledge that there is a world in which potentially hypothetical, I don't believe there is. I'm actually certain that there's not. And that's what's important. Yeah. It's like, it's an extreme, it's an extreme commitment. It's a, it's a commitment that's an ethos as strong as like the Spartan ethos. Like, and I think we try to we try to do that, like the idea of marriage till death do us part. Again, vehemently disagreed. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> death do <laughs> yeah, us part. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what? This is archaic. You know, like how about till it no longer serves us? Uh, right. Do right. we part? <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? But I, I think the the biggest key thing <laughs> is like we're we're a hundred percent all in, like all in, and there's no retracement there's no going back but to get to that level you have to really 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 trust a person and that requires 
that you trust that you, and trust yourself that requires that you've looked deeply into the darkest corner the deepest abyss of your own shadow like really looked and seen what's inside you you're capable of and yeah and and all of your desires all of your long all get really clear and your partner has done the same and is willing to do the same because what's in the shadows can come and destroy you and also lack of ignorance can destroy you like your lack of technologies and ability it can slowly erode the thing until it's no longer tenable and your drive for eros is too great and it's unsatiated and you're going to break apart you just can't hold the energy mm, the container and of the relationship exactly can't hold you it. can't you know because you, you don't know how to actually keep it flowing in the toroidal field of near the infinity loop Beautiful, of energy yeah. that's kind of passing passing through the relationship so it explodes it has to the energy has to move somewhere so I think the the most important thing is that you know we're all the way in and that doesn't mean that we haven't had some hard moments and that hasn't been tested and because my nature was always to be one foot out the door you mm -hmm. know that was always my nature like shit got squirrely with Whitney I was like we're done we're done mm -hmm. and we weren't done I was back like <laughs> you know we were back like a day later a week later two weeks later six months later whatever um <laughs> But that was always my way. And it was always my way with everybody. It was like, like this shit isn't working, I'm out. You know, like, yeah. I'm good, I'm out. And, and you get to like control the depth of intimacy with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you always feel safe because yeah. you're, not, you're not committed to anything. There's a, there's a real fear that comes from that commitment, a fear of being trapped, a fear of being stuck, a fear of no outs. But in that no outs situation, that forces the adaptation. And that forces you yeah. to have to figure it out. The it's, container forces the exactly, alchemical exactly. sort of process. Like, the initiation oh, no. requires yeah. the container. Yeah, that's that's I think the biggest the biggest thing, and it's been tested. And I've had to watch my mind go like, "Fuck, man, maybe you were wrong. Maybe this isn't." Gonna, and I was like, "Nope, nope." That's beautiful. Like that, I'm not I'm not entertaining that. And I would just show up to Vi and be like, "This is so hard for me. It's fucking killing me." but I'm all in, I'm not going anywhere, like I'm here. And in that, that's what allowed her to go through her radical healing process, you know, healing a lot for a lot of trauma from past relationships was the steadiness of that. Yeah. Like no matter what, you know, like I'm fucking here and I'm not going anywhere. So you can like, you can put that in the bank. And, um, and you know, I feel the same, the same level of commitment from her. And that's, I think, the the biggest secret of anything. And it's an that agreement is the meta agreement that allows all the other agreements to make sense. And we have other things that we try to, we have to work out, and you know, our own sh our own unique shadows that we have to try to become aware of in our own things, of course. But because of the commitment, those things all must fall into place. They're safe and our to honesty, appear. they're sure. safe to sure, yeah. Yeah, that that commitment that you that is radical requires then the commitment to all the things that are required uh, to maintain that, uh -huh. which is because I feel like so many people make a commitment till death to us part, but they don't actually commit to any of the actions that are required mm -hmm. to actually honor that commitment from a sacred space, not from a bullshit right. vows from a for realsies place. Right. For realsies. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, OK, man, thanks so much for welcome, sharing all of this. Um, for the people listening, where can they find more of you? And we'll make sure we link anything out. And if you have anything coming up that you want to share about. Aubrey Marcus podcast, great place to go. So good. We'll make sure we link the episodes that we yeah, talked about. For sure. At Aubrey Marcus on Instagram. Um, Fit for Service is an amazing group that we get together in person. And we have you know festival coming up. We got all kinds of cool shit that we're doing. So you can go to fitforservice.com if you want to hang with myself and another all the amazing coaches and guest speakers and musicians and um we got a fucking crazy lineup for this festival we're throwing in uh, in wyoming in july so everybody keep a lookout for that okay sweet we'll make sure we link it out yeah. thanks again cool thanks brother thanks man thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode if this episode resonated with you one of the best ways to support the show is to go subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any more leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it, or share the episode with your community on Instagram or whatever social place you like to hang out. 
This helps get it into more people's ears, and I'm so grateful for your support, always. Thanks again for tuning in. Much love.